help help if I turn my microphone on. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to um, our County of Placer Board of Supervisors meeting on Tuesday, February 20th, 2024. Uh, we will begin the morning with a flag salute by Supervisor Landon. All right, please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to take on the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by the County Executive Department. All items will be approved by a single roll call vote. Anyone may ask to address consent items prior to the board taking action, and the item may be removed for discussion. Would anyone like to pull an item from the consent agenda? I have none. Okay, anyone from the audience like to pull? No? Uh, how about online? No. No? Okay, so I hear a motion. Move approval. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Nope. No. Roll call. Roll call. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Jones? Oh, Aye. sorry. Holmes? No. Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Then Jones? Aye. <laughs> okay, next we will take on public comment. Persons may address the board on items not on the agenda. Please limit your comments to three minutes per person since the time allocated for public comment is 15 minutes. If all comments cannot be heard within the 15 minute time frame, the public comment period will be taken up at the end of the regular session. The board is not permitted to take any action on items addressed under public comment. However, keep in mind that the staff is taking notes and, and might, may get back to you at a later date. Anyone in the audience like to make public comment? Good morning. Okay, Wendy. Good morning. Last, last, oh, excuse me. last summer, I attended a trial in Ventura County that dealt with observers' rights in elections. The prosecution argued that the county was required to allow observers to be close enough to ballot processing activities to see whether the actions were being done correctly. Unfortunately, the judge adopted the side of the defense and declared that observers only had the right to see that election workers were busy at their tasks. In his judicial opinion, election observers did not have the right to see the details of ballot processing activities on computer screens. During the trial, the judge spoke of his fear that election workers could disrupt, that election observers could disrupt ballot processing and harass employees. In his prejudice, he did not consider that the converse could be true. Election observers could be harassed and bullied by a hostile county. This court decision should be overturned on appeal. It's ridiculous. Speed signature verification could become <clears throat> de rigueur. Election overturning fraud could be perpetrated by one or two rogue workers at a computer station. Nevertheless, nevertheless even if the decision is overturned, Election observation in California still won't be sufficient to earn our trust in the election process. One, mail-in ballots are not secure. They may be stolen from mailboxes, apartment lobbies, and care homes. Election observers cannot verify the identities of people who fill out the ballots. Concerned citizens are told to accept them all, even when they know the DMV registers all kinds of people to vote, irrespective of citizenship. Election season is too long for effective election observation. An army of election observers could theoretically provide coverage for every drop box and vote center and each ongoing ballot processing activity. But for practical observation, election day should be one day. One day of focused observation of voting and hand counting of ballots in precincts. Focused, detailed observation brings trust in the process. Three, elections run by technology cannot be verified by average citizen observers. Logic and accuracy testing of tabulators goes over the head of the average citizen, yet it is done ostensibly to give the average citizen trust in the election. This is gaslighting. Citizens are getting the sense that the government doesn't trust them to supervise their own elections, like the judge in Ventura County, like the state legislature coming down hard on Shasta County, like the massive censorship regime that crushed and eliminated criticism of mail-in ballots prior to the 2020 general election. Now we are finding it hard and plain stupid to trust the government. The trust must be earned. 
and only reforms simplifying, shortening, and decentralizing our election process will give us a solid foundation to rebuild that trust. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to meeting more of you individually to discuss my concerns. Thank Thanks. you for your comments. Are there other public comments in the audience? No, online? Yes. Speaker, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Good morning, Jennifer, Plaster County. Um, I'd, I'd like to start off by thanking Suzanne Jones for letting everybody have three minutes to talk at our housing situation the other day. Um, I just thought I'd give some more updates and things going on in the world right now. One of these things is that uh, in Quebec, all those fires that were being deemed to be related to as climate change, a man set them and pled guilty to them. Um, another interesting thing is in San Francisco right now, they're starting a program to pay criminals to not shoot people. So that county, or San Francisco in general, has pretty stringent gun laws, and now they're going to pay people to not shoot people, and it's going to be $300 a month. So I guess that shows what human life is worth to San Francisco County as well. But people can keep stabbing one another, apparently. <clears throat> I also like to bring attention that there's a disease X coming that everybody's talking about, and they're actually looking for a cure for disease X right now, um, which seems odd since we don't know what the disease is, but we're looking for a cure for it. So I'm just wondering if we are paying attention to what's going on around us. In Lahaina, in Hawaii, a huge land grab is going from all those fires, and I think it'd be very important for Placer County to be paying attention to this since we are in a pretty big fire area ourselves and seeing how the government is conducting themselves, taking land from the citizens over there. In New York City, Governor Kathy Holcomb approves temporary government jobs for migrants uh, 40,000 open positions. They don't have to go through the testing and all the procedures that normal citizens would have to go through to obtain those jobs. And they're also starting for the migrant families, um, giving them prepaid cards that are done and refilled every 28 days up to $1,000 a month, depending on family size. So I'm just wondering if we're paying attention to our citizens not getting help that we need, things being blamed on things that aren't what they're being blamed on, and if we actually have a real disease coming, or is this going to be another thing that we just went through in the last four years? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Caller, go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments. Muriel, are you able to unmute your mic? Is that better? There we go. There we go. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I clicked on the thing, but it didn't work. Um, in the updated Rezone PowerPoint presentation from the Rezone Workshop on February 13th, slide number 49, it has a breakdown of the proposed Rezone sites with their acres and potential units. This chart shows a disparity of the process used to select these rezone sites. And the chart gives you a perspective of the severe impact on the rural areas of Placer County. The tiny Penrun area in District 3 has 24.2% of the potential units for the entire county. And Penrun has more than the potential units in both District 1 and District 5. Granite Bay in District 4 has 32.5% of the units, and that is more than the units in any of the other districts. Surprisingly, the large District 2 has only 1.3% of the potential units in the county. District 5 has 18.5% of the units, 
and those are concentrated in the north rural area. By the way, the District 1 has 23.5% of the potential units. I asked the supervisors and planning to reevaluate the selection process for potential rezoned sites in the county in order to lessen the impact on rural areas, which do not have the required infrastructure needed for affordable housing. I also asked planning to clearly identify which sites and potential units can be considered for county owned properties. I hope people understand that these potential affordable housing units will be available for people who live or work outside of Placer County. Thank you very much for letting me share my observations. Thank you. I hope I went in the three minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Muriel. Okay, um, moving on to board, board member and county executive reports. Any reports? No? Um, all right. That's fast. We're going to move on to um, seven. item seven. Okay, I guess we're moving on to item seven first. Um, agriculture, parks, and natural resources. French Meadows. Good morning, Terry. Carrie. Good morning. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Good morning, Chair Jones and Honorable Supervisors. I'm Carrie Timmer. I am your Regional Forest Health Coordinator. And I'm here this morning to request your consideration and approval of a contract for further work on the French Meadows project. Um, so to give you some background, first of all, we are authorized to continue conducting work on U.S. Forest Service land. I should say U.S. Forest Service managed land. It's actually our land. Um, and we are authorized to conduct that work under a master stewardship agreement and annual supplemental project agreements. And so that gives us the authority to manage this project. Um, work, uh, the types of work that we manage include mechanical forest thinning, mastication of smaller trees, biomass removal, and other necessary operations on roughly 7,000 acres of a total 22,000 acre project area. Um, secondly, funding for this project is secured through three primary sources, um, a portion of two different grants that we have through the Sierra Nevada Conservancy, one of which is granted directly to the county, the other of which is granted to Placer County Water Agency, but through um, a professional services agreement that your board signed, the county is also managing those dollars. And then the third revenue source is uh, revenue that was previously received from the sale of timber from this project in previous work seasons. So all of the funding for the project is covered through those three sources. Uh, third, we worked with the Procurement Services Department on bid number 20450, which was released on October 24th, 2023. And we received four bids for this work with Dowling Underground and Networking Inc. submitting the lowest bid. Uh, the lowest bid results in a cost savings to the county of more than $75,000 compared to the next lowest bid. So as a result, staff recommends awarding the contract to Dowling Underground and Networking Inc., which has been deemed by procurement services to be both eligible and properly licensed. Uh, this would allow work to begin during this current year's work season with expected completion by the end of next year, 2025. Uh, the fourth point is that the proposed actions are exempt from environmental review under CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, because they are actions being taken to protect the environment. Accordingly, two notices of exemption have been filed, along with a decision notice under the National Environmental Pro Policy Act, or NEPA. And then finally, in terms of fiscal impact, uh, as mentioned before, the total cost for this agreement is $646,342 with funding again coming from those two grants and timber revenue sources that we described earlier. Uh, the money is currently in fiscal year 2023-24 budget for cost center 02004, which is uh, for natural resources and forest health. So there would be no additional impact on the general fund. So in conclusion, I know you hate this part because my, my requests are always so lengthy, but um, staff respectfully request that the board take uh, the actions that are outlined in the staff report, which I will read verbatim uh, from the staff report into the record. So first action is to request, uh, sorry, to reject three bids submitted for competitive bid number 20450 for non-commercial fuels reduction services and approve the award of competitive bid number 20450 
for non-commercial fuel reduction through Dowling Underground and Networking, Inc. to perform the designated work as part of the French Meadows Ecological Forest Restoration Project. Second action would be to authorize the Director of Agriculture, Parks, and Natural Resources, or designee, to execute the agreement with Dowling Underground and Networking, Inc. in the amount of $587,584 uh, for the period of February 20th, 2024 through December 31st, 2025, and to execute amendments up to $58,758 consistent with the Placer County procurement policy, subject, of course, to county council and risk management concurrence. And finally, to determine the proposed actions are exempt from environmental review pursuant to CEQA guidelines, section 15308. Uh, the proposed agreement was actually attached to the staff report for anyone who wanted to take a look. And so with all of that, I appreciate your consideration of this request and would be happy to respond to any questions. Board members, questions? I don't have a question, I just have a comment. I'm just happy that we're able to keep moving forward on this project. Uh, I've been involved with it ever since uh, it started. And the Dowling Company has done a remarkable job already in the, for, in the French Manos area. So I am enthusiastic about continuing it. And I will move approval. OK. Um, Supervisor Gustafson. I had a question, um, Carrie. Thank you. And I agree with everything Supervisor Holmes said. Dowling Company's done a great job, and staff has done a great job. Is this our last phase of this project, or do we have one more to come? Well, depending on how, how one wants to define phase, um, we have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are, uh, we're approximately 55% done, both in terms of number of acres on the ground and also the number of treatment acres. Because right. if you recall, sometimes a single acre on the ground gets more than one treatment. Right. So out of the 7,000 acres, we're about, we've completed 100% of the activity on about 4,000 acres, and we have some level of remaining activity on about 3,000. Okay. Uh, we, if all goes well, um, if Mosquito Ridge Road is reopened on time, uh, we have the vendors lined up and we have the funding available. We anticipate, hope, we're cautiously optimistic that we would be able to conclude the project work by the end of 2025. So that would be two more work seasons this year and, and next, next year. year. Okay, great. Well, great job out there and just look forward to getting it wrapped up and continuing on to other projects too. Thank Indeed. you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions by the board? Okay, seeing none. Um, is there anyone in the public that would like to comment or ask questions regarding this topic? Anyone online? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board then. We have a motion by Supervisor Holmes. I'll second. And a second by Supervisor Gustafson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay, now we're going on to number one. Okay, we're going to move back to item number one. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Okay, so we have to go to... Okay, all right. We're going to move on then to eight, because it's not time to go on to number one. <laughs> Okay, uh, human resources, reproductive loss leave, Nicole Lopez. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board, Nicole L Lopez, the Interim Human Resources Director. This morning I'm bringing before you an item related to reproductive loss leave. This item requests your approval of side letter agreements between the Placer Public Employee Organization, PPEO, the Deputy Sheriff's Association, the DSA, the Placer County Law Enforcement uh, Management Association, Lima, as well as the Deputy District Attorneys Association, DDAA, as well as the introduction of the ordinance and waiving the oral reading to amend Chapter 3 of the County Code related to reproductive loss leave for all eligible employees. You may recall last January 2023, Assembly Bill 1949 amended the California Fair Employment and Housing Act to entitle eligible employees to take up to five days of bereavement leave upon the death of a covered family member. In follow-up to AB 1949 and effective January 1 of 2024, Senate Bill 848 
expands circumstances of bereavement leave by allowing eligible employees to take up to five days for a reproductive loss. A reproductive loss is that that which have resulted in the employee being a parent, including failed surrogacy of adoption, miscarriage, stillborn, or an unsuccessful assisted reproduction. Modifications to the memoranda of understanding with Placer County's employee groups are necessary to ensure regulatory compliance with SB 848. Through meet and confer process, labor groups each agree to the updated provisions, which are documented in the proposed side letters, as well as the proposed ordinance that amends chapter three of the county code to ensure reproductive loss leave is available for all eligible employees effective January 1, 2024. Thank you for your consideration of this item. If you have any questions, I available to answer I just have one quick question if there's more than one loss in a consecutive year is it um, are there limits on it or what is the there are limits it can be five days per episode or incident but a maximum of 20 per year if they do restart each year Seeing no other questions here, anyone in the audience like to have comments or questions? No? How about online? No? Okay, we're going to bring it back to the board then. I'll, I'll move approval of the items. Okay, approval by Supervisor Gore. I'll second. And a second by Supervisor Landon. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing done. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have the next item. Should we move <laughs> it on? Okay, excellent. Please. <laughs> the next item introduces an ordinance, waives oral reading, amending the uncodified schedule of classifications and compensation ordinance to implement salary adjustments for members <coughs> of the Board of Supervisors pursuant to Placer County Charter Section 207. To provide historical background, in 2014, Placer County voters approved a provision in the charter that scripts how the Board of Supervisors salaries are set based upon a calculation of neighboring counties and those of El Dorado, Nevada, and Sacramento in January and then applied in the first full pay period in February every calendar year. This item requests approval of the ordinance amending the uncodified schedule of classifications and compensation, which is a ministerial requirement based on the charter. So the item before you is not re requesting the timeline or the calculation, but the approval of the uncodified ordinance that implements those changes. If you have any questions, of course, I'm here to answer any of those. Otherwise, um, okay. please consider this request. Board members, any questions? Comments? I have one quick okay. question. Supervisor Sorry, uh, okay. I was just wondering, I, if I remember correctly, there was a management salary study that was going to be coming forward. I was just wondering if you have a timeline for that. Yes, we're targeting March 12th meeting for that item to come oh, okay. forward for your Great. consideration. Thanks. Okay, seeing no other questions, anyone Supervisor in the public? Jones. Oh, yes, uh, I have, I have one question. Um, in our comparable studies for all of our other classifications, do we use Sacramento County in those? Yes. In all of those? Yes. So for all of our leadership? In yes. Those. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seeing no further questions, anyone in the in the audience? Anyone online? Okay. Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. I'll move approval of the item. Okay. A uh, motion by Supervisor Gore. I'll second. And a second by Supervisor Landon. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. That's me. Okay. All right. So we have one uh, opposite. One opposed from. Supervisor Gustafson. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so now we're still too early, right? Moving on to item nine. Item nine, Public Works. Receive an update on evaluation of the Cabin Creek Biomass Facility at Eastern Regional Landfill. Jared Deck, good morning. 
Good morning, Chair Jones. Uh, good morning, Supervisors. Uh, Jared Deck, Program Manager for Environmental Engineering. Here to present the item before you for the update of the feasibility study for Cabin Creek Biomass Facility, as well as the request of authorization for the RFP. Um, so back in March of 22, the board approved the feasibility study for this facility. So looking at the existing project that was proposed back in 2017. And so since that point, I've been working to kind of understand the project itself, as well as complete a few different things to kind of help get the project in a good standing order. Uh, the first real task I was looking at while I was working through this project was to gain regional support. There was a lot of opposition in the region when this project was initially evaluated. So I wanted to work out and reach out to folks to understand what the problems were and to help people understand really how this project could be a benefit to the community. So within that, um, we started the North Tahoe Truckee Biomass Task Force. And so within that task force, we have the folks inside of it, which is the County of Nevada, North Star Community Service District, Town of Truckee, the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, the Truckee Fire Protection District, and the County of Placer. And also we've just recently added the Sugar Bowl Ski Resort as well. So this um, group continues to grow as there's gaining support for biomass facilities in the North Tahoe region. We also have support from the Placer County Biomass Consortium, and also some of the nonprofits up there like the Tahoe Fund have been very supportive of this project. So looking at this project, my real goals were to try to understand how we could benefit the community from this project. Uh, one of the main things was really reducing catastrophic wildfire. Since uh, 2021, just within our local forest, over 300,000 acres of our forest have been burned just to catastrophic wildfire. Um, just in suppression efforts, that's cost over $1.4 billion. And so a massive impact just to our local community in really the last uh, three years. So looking at that, I mean, the main goal of this facility is to take that woody biomass out of the forest and put it to advantage, use it for something productive. And so the next goal was to understand what that productive value could be. And so what the project was really scoped for was producing renewable energy. And also we were looking at producing a renewable fuel as well for this project. Since there's no real local outlets for biomass, we are trucking this biomass currently 200 mile round trips to places like Rio Bravo and Honey Lake, which are current biomass facilities in the region. And so very long transits for getting rid of this biomass. And so if we're able to establish those local biomass facilities, either through our facility or other local jurisdictions, we'd have a local outlet to get rid of that biomass and reduce the overall cost for our business of providing that. So some of the markets that I was looking at, in order to make these biomass facilities pencil, it's really hard. Um, that's why you don't see a lot of these, because the private industry is really not interested in them, and they're very tricky to actually make the markets pencil. So the real things I was looking at was net metering on-site energy, so taking that energy that we produce and use it on-site for our facilities, um, selling the excess energy to a local provider like Liberty Energy, creating byproducts like biochar, which is great for the ag community, or creating carbon credits, which you can sell in the voluntary market. Also, we can apply for the low carbon fuel standard, which is for transferring our public fleets over to low emission vehicles. We can actually get a credit for that from CARB. And then last, looking at SB 1383, which is a procurement offset. So requiring requirements of organic recycling, we can actually get offset credits for that. So as we're looking into that, I mean, some of those markets are really tricky. The biochar and the carbon credit markets have been non-established for a long time. They're more voluntary markets than anything else. So looking at those, we're really trying to establish some partners in this field, um, specifically talking to large agencies like Workday or Salesforce to potentially sell those carbon credits to, or our ag department for sale of the biochar in our local communities. So to kind of give you an overview of Eastern Regional Landfill, uh, where this project is currently spec to site. On the left-hand side, you see the picture of an overview of North Lake Tahoe, 80 quarter coming through, Truckee, and then if you fall 89 down where the, the tree is marked, that's Eastern Regional Landfill. And currently we have a closed landfill site there. We have our material recovery facility as well that processes all the solid waste in the region. We have our TARP facility, which all has all the local transit and the buses for that region, um, as well as some administrative buildings there. And so the picture on the right shows the identified three acre parcel. This parcel was set aside originally in 2017 for the potential use of the, the site for a biomass facility. So looking at the facility a little bit more in depth too, from understanding those markets that we have, I really wanted to create just a circular economy where we have 
an opportunity to use some of this local biomass that we get from our community, from defensible space clearing, from utility clearings, or from forest management projects. Take that material and use it as much as we can on site. So on site we have energy demand from the buildings. So those administrative buildings I talked about, as well as charging our electric fleet that we're going to transfer over to some of the TARP buses. Um, taking the energy and using it directly there on site to net metering our costs as energy costs go up. Also, we have a large public transit fleet there through TART. Um, they have fuel needs and they have energy needs. Like I said, they're transferring over four buses in the near future to electric buses. And in the future, their zero emission vehicle standards will be coming up. So potential use of an alternative fuel there will be very vital. Also, like I talked about biochar, we have a great local ag community. So I think benefiting that community and providing a reliable product that they could actually use and benefit them would be very beneficial to the overall community and as well as this project. So stepping back, um, looking at just the county owned projects. So this would be the original project that was proposed. It was a two megawatt biomass energy project. So that was pretty much taking that wood waste, converting it to energy and putting it out onto the grid. It would take about 13,000 bone dry tons of biomass per year to run that facility. So a great opportunity for the facility itself. Currently what we have on site is about 30,000 bone dry tons. So we'd be able to use about a third of that directly on site. Um, we have a currently our approved IR, EIR for that project. And like I mentioned before, an identified three acre site that's already approved for this project. Um, I talked through some of the revenue opportunities before, but diving into this when I was doing the financial analysis of it, um, it's really tricky because biochar and carbon credits, they're not established markets. They have a lot of volatility in them and there's no long-term agreements that we can put in place to actually sustain a guaranteed revenue source for those. So as I was doing the analysis, I wanted to be as completely open as possible in understanding this and wanted to exclude those because we couldn't guarantee that income coming in over a long period of time. And so with that, um, the adjusted numbers that I made and kind of to understand what the annual yield would be for this project, with excluding both the biochar and the carbon credits, potentially the facility would be at a negative $700,000 loss per year, which is very tricky to understand and handle. There's opportunities to supplement that, but it, without those, it's very tricky to make this facility operate and financially be feasible. And that's why you don't see a lot of these facilities established throughout the state. If we were able to maximize both those opportunities, the biochar, selling that to our local ag community, and as well as capitalizing on the carbon credits, so selling those to a large voluntary provider, we'd be able to pretty much make the project break even. And so there is an opportunity for it to break even, but it's a little bit trickier, and there's no long-term guarantee with that. So just trying to be as open as possible through the process of the variability and the span of what this project could do, either at a loss or a potential break even. So while I was working through that, I was also working on kind of a dual uh, avenue to create a project here. And that was looking at the public-private partnership and looking out in the community and the business sector to understand if there's anybody else who would be interested in actually partnering with a project on site. And so what we got was um, we we're partnering with a great company, Biogas Energy, and we received a $500,000 grant from the Department of Conservation. This was to look at uh, establishing alternative fuels on site there. So using that biomass to create renewable fuels like hydrogen, methanol, or something else, or even bio oil. And so through that project, we've been working on that over the last year. Um, we came to the point of the state budget negotiations this year, and unfortunately for that grant, it was going to be a $10 million grant per project. We actually lost that opportunity due to the state budget cuts, and so that project actually went away at that point, unfortunately. So that brings us to kind of the final ask. Really looking at this, I wanted to provide you guys an update of where we're at with the originally proposed facility, so the two megawatt facility, as well as kind of show you the opportunity of what might be out there for public-private partnerships. And so just to read through the action requested items, the first one was to receive an update on the Cabin Creek Biomass Facility Project at Eastern Regional Landfill, including status of feasibility and financial evaluations for construction and operation of a biomass facility. The second is kind of the ask for you guys if you'd like to approve and move forward with kind of looking at the public-private partnership and what's out there. It would be to authorize the director of public works or designee <coughs> to prepare and release a request for proposals for Cabin Creek biomass facility, focusing on the utilization of on-site woody biomass for production of renewable energy, renewable fuel, or beneficial biomass-based products, subject to county council and risk management concerns. And then the last note is just to determine the proposed actions are not projects pursuant to CEQA guidelines, section 15378. And so with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have.
Thank, thank you. Board members? Yes, Supervisor Gustafson. Thanks, Jared, and I really appreciate um, how hard you've been working on this and, and looking under all the stones out there to see how we can uh, move forward with this. Um, the reduction of transport costs, is that calculated in your net revenues? So that's all in there already. Yes, that was included in there. So the balance of not having to transport that out and having a local market to buy that was included into that. Was included in that. And then um, uh, what is the cost to go ahead and, and uh, prepare and release the RFP? Um, so it'll be minimal cost. Uh, we've already been working on that slowly. Um, so we'd use probably internal staff and maybe a small consultant um, as well to finalize that. So nominal cost. So it wouldn't cost us much more to get an RFP out on the street and see what opportunities are out there. I know that um, the Camptonville model that I just heard about from through Sierra Nevada Conservancy uh, is an interesting model, and that particular operator, you know, is looking at a three meg uh, plant. Um, but I think. It's worth us getting those details, and then I know a number of us are going to D.C. Uh, for both our federal legislative efforts as well as mine uh, for the SNPLA money uh, funding. And this is a perfect project to try to secure federal funding for because we're, we're treating so much of the federal forest in the Tahoe Basin. So um, I'd like to encourage us to continue uh, with the RFP, um, if it's not that much more cost, to really give us the opportunity to know what the numbers are and if there's any unique opportunities out there from a proposer. Uh, they may open doors to other funding streams or other viability as well. Yep. Thank you for all your hard work on this. Thank you. And just a note too, um, that feasibility analysis that I did for the cost, those did not include in any grants at all. That was just full bearing of the cost and the capital cost for the project was about $25 million. Right. So, so with if any we, additional grants, we could kind of cut that down and very quickly right. make that potentially pencil. Yeah. And we never know if the state will be back next year and offering those programs. But I think going the next step and having that would be wise on our part. Thank you, Supervisor Holmes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Jared. This is uh, something that I've been kind of involved in for the last 20 years. We've been trying uh, ever so slowly to get get one of these places built on the ground. Uh, I, I agree with Supervisor Gustafson's um, remarks. <clears throat> this is something we just got to keep moving forward until we finally get through uh, to the legislature and to uh, those, the individuals that benefit from this. Does two megawatts of energy produce enough energy for the, bio, for the regional uh, Plant up in Cabin Creek? Yes, so um, two megawatts would be plenty. We could possibly, just for on site uh, net metering, it's about a half a megawatt. So we'd be producing about 1.5 megawatts additional power if you go to the two megawatt option. So about half a megawatt is what's currently being used on site. Okay, there's so many benefits. I just hope we can make, pencil it out. Thank you. Supervisor Landon. Uh, just a comment, no questions, but um, I definitely agree with my colleagues. I think this is such a great potential opportunity and uh, hoping that maybe the federal visits this year are fruitful and maybe getting some other grant funding, but definitely worth moving forward, at least at this point. Yes, Supervisor Gore. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate your work. Um, I wanted to clarify, you said that a two megawatt plant could utilize 13,000 of BDT, which is the biomass, right, that's yep. there. But we actually have up to 30,000 BDT, correct? Correct. That could be utilized annual, annually. Yep. And, and so I ask that because I do think that this is a really good opportunity to look at a public-private partnership because they may be able to be really creative with how we might use that additional biomass um, and as well as ideas that we might have not have thought of. So I, I'm really supportive of moving forward with an RFP, um, and I really appreciate the, the reminder that we should go and advocate for some federal funding as well, since it is federal, federal forest, forest land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions, does anyone in the audience uh, like to ask questions or make comments? Good morning. Morning, Chair Jones, uh, board members. Um, Wayne Nader, 
Uh, this is a project I agree with uh, Supervisor Holmes has been in uh, out there for way too long. We need this done. Uh, we should have had it done already. I know there's complications in it. We needed to work with the with the residents up there to make sure that this was something that would fit into their community. But we all know that the fuel loads have just, uh, that's one of our biggest challenges, is that the fuel loads in the forest areas are just uh, extreme. And this gives, I think, a better opportunity for us to really address that, uh, certainly within the immediate area. The one question I had is, I'm sorry, Jared, I don't know if you said it. I'm not sure what's the cost for this facility. What are we estimating it to be? Uh, I know that's a, you know, a moving target on uh, construction these days, but I was just curious about what the amount actually is going to come up to. Thank you for your comments. Any other comments in the audience? Comments online? Okay, Chair, would you like to answer? Respond. So currently, the proposed two megawatt biomass energy facility will be about twenty-five million dollars. Okay, all right. Um, I would just say, like to say um, that yes, Placer County, we should be on the cutting edge. <laughs> we do a lot of things better than other counties do. So, all right, we'll bring it back to the board. Any other questions? No, I'll move approval. Okay. okay so we have a motion by Supervisor Gustafson, second by Supervisor Holmes. Um, does this require? No. no. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yay. We get to go to item number one. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> item number one is uh, Board of Supervisors. We have a proclamation today. We're here to approve a proclamation establishing February 2024 as Grand Jury Awareness Month in Placer County. So do we just move straight on to the, to the, um, to the proclamation? We have to vote on it after we read it? Okay. All righty, we have a proclamation. County of Placer proclamation in the matter of a proclamation recognizing February 2024 as Grand Jury Awareness Month in Placer County. Whereas, every year in each of California's 58 counties, 19 ordinary citizens take an oath to voluntarily serve a term of one year as grand jurors. And whereas, grand juries have been in existence since the adoption of California's original constitution in 1849 to 1850. And whereas, grand juries conduct their investigations under the auspices of the Super Superior Court of California and have broad access to public officials, employees, records, and information. One of the most important functions of a grand jury is to review the operations of the office, officers, departments, and agencies of local government. And whereas grand juries are charged with investigating and reporting on local government governmental operations to assure that their responsibilities are being fulfilled legally, efficiently, honestly, and in the best interest of the public. Grand juries serve as a watchdog authority and are well suited to the effective investigation of local governments because they are independent bodies operationally separate from the entities and officials that they investigate. And whereas the grand juries fact-finding efforts result in reports that contain specific recommendations aimed at identifying problems and offering ways to improve government operations and enhance responsiveness. And whereas the hard work done by grand juries has a great effect on our communities and makes California a better place to live. And whereas the reward of being a grand juror is the satisfaction received from working with fellow residents and community members to improve local government for all. And whereas in 2009, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger declared February to be California Grand Jury Awareness Month. And whereas it is appropriate to recognize the efforts of those jurors, both past and present, who have volunteered their time and service to the Placer County Grand Jury. Now therefore be it proclaimed that the above proclamation was duly passed by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Placer on behalf of the citizens of Placer County at a regular meeting held February 20th, 2024, proclaim, proclaiming the month of February 2024 as Grand Jury Awareness Month. 
signed by the board chair, Suzanne Jones, me, and congratulations to the grand jurors. <laughs> Okay. All right. Do we have any comments by the public? Any? Sure. Do I just I wanted to um, I forgot just to ask mention the board. that I'm sorry. Uh, one comment is they're holding workshops. Are you going to announce your workshops? Yes. Great. <laughs> um, because I think that's a great outreach strategy to our community to know better what you're doing and offering that Zoom participation is great too. Thank you. So I'll let you do that. I'll go first. I'll go first this year. <laughs> Uh, Barbara Ferguson, I'm currently the four-person, um, second year is four-person. So thank you this morning for um, recognizing us. Um, California is the only state in the union that has it written into their constitution that every county has to um, seat a civil grand jury every year. In our county, we also can act as a criminal grand jury if the DA comes to us and requests that. Um, we are a watchdog. We look over county, city governments, special districts, school districts. We also are tasked with inspecting all of the jails, uh, holding facilities, and the juvenile detention centers each year. At the end, like the proclamation said, we have to issue a report. That final report includes individual reports on all of the investigations and inspections that have been done during the term. There are 19 jurors, and um, they are volunteers. And just for fun, I did a little math yesterday. So far, just in meetings, this is not how much work is done outside at home by yourself. We've logged almost 3,000 hours. Um, and our work is ramping up as we start editing reports, writing reports. So it's going to hit probably double that at least. Um, I do have seven other jurors with me today, if I can make them stand up, which I didn't tell them I was going to do that. Um, I have Margo and Linda, Lisa, Sue, Norma, Wendy, and Lee. And combined, many of these, um, we've got a couple that are first year, but many jurors return. So there's about 14 years of experience standing there. Um, one of the challenges every year for the Superior Court is getting enough people to serve on the grand jury. It is a one-year commitment, and um, recently they um, issued a press release requesting um, people to apply. Um, Supervisor Jones, I know you put that in your latest email. I asked last year, I'm asking again, if you guys would please include that press release in your emails out to uh, your residents. Actually, during um, interviews last year, there were a number of applicants that said it was because of your emails that they even knew about the grand jury. So if you could do that again. And then in June, when we release our report, if you could say the reports out there, that would be great too. Again, just making the public aware. That press release talks about meet and greets that we're going to have in April. Um, both via Zoom and in person, where we kind of explain to potential jurors what we do, how much time is involved, et cetera. So uh, we'll be doing those in April. We also have an outreach committee that is going out to um, groups like the Rotaries and Lions Clubs and those types of organizations. So again, thank you for recognizing us. And I'll turn it over to Al. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, a chairperson, Suzanne Jones, and members of the Board of Supervisors. I am Al Witten. I'm the president of the Placer County Grand Jurors Association. Uh, we have today two members here from our Placer County Grand Jurors Association, plus a couple of the members that are sitting on the grand jury are also members of the Placer County Grand Jurors Association. Uh, Carol Witten, who served on the 20, uh, the 2019-2020 grand jury. Myself, I served on the 2009-2010 grand jury. And there are a couple members of the, as I said, the sitting grand jury that are also members of our group. <clears throat> our association, Placer County Grand Jurors Association, is an educational outreach for recruiting and informing the public in regards to our Placer County Grand Jurors. 
By bestowing today this awareness proclamation, you have again demonstrated your support for the re investigating and reporting efforts of the sitting grand jury. Their efforts throughout the year continue, and we thank you for your continued support. Going forward, only through active recruiting can we continue to maintain the high standards being demonstrated by these 19 members of the grand jury. Therefore, any further additional support that you can offer and lend to the members of the grand jury will always be appreciated. Again, I thank you for bestowing upon us the proclamation for 2024. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Um, for the board members, yes. Board members like to comment, please? Supervisor Gore. And just one thing, thank you so much. Appreciate really all of your hard work and your willingness to serve. And definitely do um, let us know when you need us to promote uh, the application period. I think it's really important that our residents do know that this, that we do have a grand jury and they have an opportunity to serve. So thank you all for just your willingness to do so as well as your willingness to grill us all. I think we've all uh, met with you and had an opportunity to, to share with you about the work that we do on the Board of Supervisors, so I really appreciate it. Supervisor Gustafson. Uh, I, too, wanted to thank you all and, and agree that you do ask tough questions um, that we're not at liberty to discuss here publicly, but um, it really does show the community that we do have a watching agency looking out over us, and that's so important to the credibility of government at all forms, so thank you. Supervisor Landon. Just echo my colleagues' comments and want to say thank you so much for the many, many hours that you put into volunteering. And I know that just in our culture now, it's already hard enough to get people to volunteer or to join groups like Rotary or Lions Club. So uh, anything we can do to support you in getting the word out, we will definitely do. And just thank you once again. Supervisor Holmes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have appeared before the grand jury in my career, let's just say more than once. Uh, <laughs> but I've always appreciated the professional approach, uh, the respect that the grand jury affords us, and always appreciate the candid conversation we we're able to have to better inform the grand jury and the public about what, we're, what we do. Um, and I always look forward to the grand jury reports coming out. So. Anyhow, uh, thank you all for your hard work. I know it's uh, sometimes maybe tedious, but it's important work to keep our citizens informed and keep uh, our elected officials on track. So appreciate it, and I move approval. Okay, I'll do I? All right. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, any opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes. Um, I do want to make one more acknowledgement of the folks that you just announced. Um, if the ladies would stand, um, of course, Barbara Ferguson and then uh, Wendy Beal, Lisa Rose, Margo Cave, Linda Cook, Sue Kukral, Lee Lawson, Al Witten, Carol Witten, and Ed Lehman. One more? Norma Worley. Oh, Norma. They didn't put your name on my list, Norma. Okay, wonderful. All right, now that I have you all standing, let's come down for a photo. First, we'll do one um, with me and, and all of you, and then um, hopefully the board will join us as well. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, there's, there's so, so many, many people. people. We'll just have it. You go ahead.
two. All right, we are going to move on to item number two, the library. Um, <clears throat> Okay, li library calf re request an initial donation from Friends of the Auburn Library. Mary George, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Jones and members of the board. I'm Mary George, your Director of Library Services. It's my pleasure to be here this morning to introduce you to Louise Isaacson. She is the president of the Friends of the Auburn Library, and Louise is going to tell you about an exciting bequest that we've received that will um, enhance and support all of our libraries. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Jones. Good morning, board. Um, I'm very honored to represent Friends of the Auburn Library, another local volunteer group. And um, we, you know, today illustrates how important people are to the library. Library really is not a building, it's made of people. And Marjorie uh, Taylor, excuse me, Marjorie Hope Calf understood that and did a legacy for our Auburn Library. And this is Marjorie. She was a teacher and uh, with a very interesting background. She was born in 1926. And if you think about she was one of 10 children born in Kansas. And um, if you think about it, 1926, that means her youth had 10 years of the Great Depression, followed by World War II. But yet, she went on to get a college degree in education. After getting her college degree, she joined the Navy, and where she served for nine years. And uh, I must say, though, that I forgot to say, she was very interested in sports, too. And uh, gradu when she graduated, she was uh, all-star in four different sports from college in those days. <laughs> well, then she after the Navy, where she rose to the rank of lieutenant, she um, got her master's degree focusing on history. And then her interest in Auburn began. She came to Auburn and was a teacher for 25 years um, in history and women's studies. And even some of our board members had her as a, a teacher. Well, Marjorie always loved the library and was a conservationist. And during her lifetime, she, she supported the library in many ways. And then she set up a trust. And so in July of last year, we received a check, just a little standard check for $300,000. Uh, a little overwhelming. And so we put most of the money in a high yield account and uh, reserve some to give to the library this fiscal year and next fiscal year. So we're honored today to present the first check of $25,000 to the library. Now Marjorie was very adamant about what the money was to be used for. It was to focus on nonfiction books to enhance all collections for all ages though. So a true advocate for the library. So today we'd like to um, honor and present you with the first check. We've been working with the library and they're ready to enhance that collection. Ted. And if I could have all the other members of uh, Friends of the Library stand up. There's several of them here. Yes, we will. <laughs> Should, um, well, we will. We'll accept it and then we'll come back and make our comments, okay? okay great. Come oh, board. Okay. Should we wait until they make comments? Okay, you're up. You're up. Yeah. Okay, we, we can do it out of order. But it is a special moment.
Oh, thank you. Okay, I think I'll start to the right, Supervisor Holmes. I'm sure you'd like to say something, wouldn't you, to the, to the Friends of the Library? Well, my uh, great thanks to the Friends of the Library uh, and this wonderful gift that uh, has been requested to us. So I know that you will spend it wisely, and I'm very pleased that it goes for nonfiction books, which are my favorite. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you, and congratulations to you. Okay, and Super I'll move approval if I need to do that. Supervisor Gustafson. I just, I too want to thank you, and I, and I, uh, I think it's such a great legacy and an example for others to remember in their estate planning as well for all of us yes. and, and for the community. So thank you for all that you do. Supervisor Gore. Oh, I thought your light was on. No, I'm, I'm just, sorry. Supervisor Landon. Well, just want to say um, what a blessing to the community, and I agree with Supervisor Gustafson. What a great reminder to all of us of just, you know, as we're thinking down the road of planning. Um, I know that Mary is going to do some great things with it, and I agree, nonfiction is my favorite. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to say congratulations. That is quite a legacy, and um, it's amazing. I just uh, participated in presenting a check from Friends of the Library in Granite Bay just about two weeks ago. Oh. And that was a very exciting time. So this is even more exciting, I would say. Um, congratulations. And, and she was quite a woman. Yes. I think she was um, ahead of her time. In more ways than one, it was, I agree with you. Yes. So now let's, um, any comment from the public? Please come forward if you'd like to make a comment or ask questions. Anyone from the um, online? No? Okay. So I think um, Supervisor Holmes, you made a motion? Second. Okay. Motion by Holmes, second by Gustafson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Congratulations, everyone. And thank you all for coming today to participate. Okay. So moving on to item number three. The sheriff. We uh, are going to hear AB 481, annual report and approval to acquire additional equipment. Good morning. Morning, Madam Chair, honorable morning. board members. Captain Brian Silva with the sheriff's office. I'm here um, presenting <coughs> Uh, AB 481 and the Sheriff's Office use of military equipment. September 30th, 2021, Governor Newsom signed into law AB 481, creating Government Code 770, relating to the use of military equipment by California law enforcement agencies. AB 481 seeks to provide transparency, oversight, opportunity for meaningful public input on decisions regarding whether and how specific equipment is funded, acquired, or used. Placer County Sheriff's Office is in possession of certain items of equipment that qualify as military equipment under AB 481. AB 481 requires that law enforcement agency possessing such qualified equipment prepare a publicly released written equipment use policy document, documenting and covering the inventory, description, purpose, use, acquisition, maintenance, physical impacts, procedure, training, oversight, and compliant process applicable to the agency's use of such equipment. Public safety equipment policy and supporting information was in initially adopted by your board on May 10th, 2022. AB 41 requires the governing body to review the policy annually and to vote whether to renew the policy in general. AB 41 emerged the following, following the events in Ferguson, Missouri in August of 2014 and the use of military grade equipment. In response, California reevaluated the utilization of such equipment through the 1033 program, broadening its understanding and application 
Our perspective is to employ this equipment for public safety, particularly in crisis intervention and life-saving efforts. It is important to recognize certain equipment, notably drones, is accessible to the general public. And without oversight or specific training, however, in law enforcement, there is a requisite for training, accountability, and transparent reporting, all of which are accessible to our public via our, via our webpage. We re request the additional newer model drone, the DJI Advanta, which is available to the general public. I'd also like to note that several pieces of equipment that qualify for AB 481 will be mobilized during this weekend's World Cup ski event that's taking place uh, at the Palace States Tahoe to ensure the safety of thousands of people coming to Tahoe Basin when Placer County is put on the world stage. On behalf of the Assistant Sheriff, Under Sheriff, and Sheriff, we receive substantial support in terms of both training and equipment address, to address crisis situations effectively. Without this equipment, there is no alternative or resource to turn to in an emergency. With that, I'll turn it back over to the board. Thank you for that. Um, board members, anyone have questions, comments? I, I don't have a question. I just had a comment that I wish we didn't need some of this equipment, but I know we do, and that's the unfortunate part. And I'm so happy to support the sheriffs receiving this equipment and having it. Okay, so um, we'll, does anyone from the audience like to have a question or comment? Anyone online? Okay, seeing none. We need to read the motion. Oh, okay. All right, so who would like to make a motion and read it when you make that motion? I'll be happy to. Okay. <clears throat> I move to approve, um, we've already introduced it, so approve the addition of a new item, a DGI Avanta unmanned aircraft system to the approved military equipment list in the updated Placer County Sheriff's Office General Orders Operations 27 policy entitled AB 481 Public Safety Equipment. Move up a second. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Gustafson and a second by Supervisor Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Do you Thank need you. me to make the other motion too? And and is number one need to be a motion? Okay, I apologize. I've got to read three of these. Sorry. Okay. We did Hang one. In there. Okay. Now we're going to go. No, no, well, no, no, okay. Don't uh, I move to approve the uncodified ordinance, waive oral reading, approving the continued use of public safety equipment, and adopt the updated Placer County Sheriff's Office General Orders Operations 27 policy entitled AB 481 Public Safety Equipment in accordance with Government Code Section 7070-7075 for the use of specified equipment. All second. Okay, so we have a motion by Gustafson, a second by Gore. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. And then the third motion, receive the Placer County Sheriff's Office 2024 AB 481 annual report as required under government code 7072A. So I move approval of that. Second. Okay, motion by Gustafson, second by Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to move on to item number four, probation, AB 481 annual report. Welcome. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm probation manager Mark Egger. We are here today to provide an update regarding our unmanned aerial system, UAS, often referred to as a drone and provide an annual report pursuant to AB 481 as mandated by 7072A of the Government Code. The action requested this morning is to introduce an ordinance, waive oral reading, approving the continued use of public safety equipment as outlined in the Probation Department's Public Safety Equipment Unmanned Aerial System Operations Policy in accordance with Government Code Section 7070 through 7075. Over the last year, the probation department has used our drone on 40 occasions. The utilization of this critical piece of equipment assisted our probation officers and our homeless outreach team 
We used it for camp cleanups, for example, before and after photos, community outreach, uh, locating homeless camps throughout the county, and increasing our ability to supervise probationers and connect and provide services to the unhoused populations. That concludes our brief overview this morning. So again, we are requesting that your board waive oral reading and approve the continued use of our public safety equipment, UAS, in accordance with government code section 7070 through 7075. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions by board members? Okay, hearing none, do we have questions in the audience? Anyone online? Okay, we're gonna bring it back to the board then. Move approval. Uh, if I could first um, clarify that the first, the motion will be to introduce an uncodified ordinance waive all reading approving the continued use of public safety equipment as outlined under the Placer County Probation Department's AB 481 related policy entitled Public Safety Equipment Unmanned Aerial System Operations in accordance with Government Code Sections 7070 to 7075 for the use of the specified equipment and then the second motion was read into the record. I'll second. Okay, so we have a motion by Supervisor Holmes, second by Supervisor Gustafson. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. All right, so we're going to move on to item number five, District Attorney, AB 481 Annual Report. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Lieutenant Vince Dudo with the Placer County District Attorney's Office Investigations Unit. I'm here today on behalf of our District Attorney, Morgan Geyer, and our Chief Investigator, Mary Green. Um, as you know, we're here today for our annual AB 481 report to submit to the board. For our unit's purposes, we're not requesting the purchase of any new equipment, so we're gonna be uh, asking for two actions. Uh, the first is to introduce an uncodified ordinance Waive oral reading approving the continued use of public safety equipment um, adopted uh, to adopt the district attorney's military equipment policy as required by California Government Code Section 770 through 775 for the use of that specified equipment. And number two, we're asking that the board receive the Placer County District Attorney's Office 2023 AB 481 annual report as required under Government Code 772 subsection A. As a little bit of background, uh, last year on uh, February 28th, 2023, your board adopted an ordinance approving um, our policy in accordance with the listed government code sections. Um, and additionally, AB 481 requires us to prepare an annual report to present to the governing body uh, of our, our, uh, our unit, which is this board, and that we ask that that uh, report be accepted. Uh, there's no changes in our report from last year, but I am available to answer any questions if the board has any. Okay, board members, any questions? Supervisor, oops, Holmes? <laughs> no, okay. All right, seeing none, I'll open it up to the public. Any questions, comments from the public? Anyone online? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board then. The to only thing I would note is that it was, it's the 2024 report as opposed to the 2023. When he read it into the record, he said 2023, but just noting that, Correct. sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. All those in favor then? Oh, I didn't, we didn't move it. Oh, motion, I guess I do need a motion. Okay. Move approval. <laughs> motion by Gus, Supervisor Gustafson? Second. And a second by Supervisor Gore. Okay, now all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, Aye. motion passes. Thank you thank for your you. time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to item number five. Oh, no, we just did five, I'm sorry. I'm just a little slow today. So we are going to move back to 9B. On-site parts warehouse management services. Genuine parts company. That's right. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, <laughs> Chair Jones, board members. I'm Matt Randall, deputy director with uh, Public Works here representing the fleet division and here to talk about auto parts. So what's more exciting than that? <laughs> uh, we've got a couple of different actions here. First is a proven increase to the existing contract with Genuine Parts Company for providing on-site parts warehouse management service in the amount of $1.3 million 
increasing the maximum amount to $3 million for the period through March 20, uh, 31st, 2024. The second action is asking you to approve the renewal of this contract from April 1st, 2024 to March 30th, uh, 31st, 2025, and then two additional one-year terms in the amount, in the maximum amount of $2.5 million per year, and then also authorize change orders not to exceed uh, the amount of $100,000 annually, consistent with the county procurement policy manual. Uh, and then the last two items are authorizing the purchasing manager to sign all required documents uh, subject to department concurrence and available funding. And then finally, determine that the proposed actions are exempt from environmental review pursuant to CEQA guidelines 15301D. So a, a little bit of background on this one. This is our, uh, our parts management contract for our Auburn fleet division um, that's in-house. So they supply parts uh, not only for our county vehicles, but all of our uh, operational equipment uh, for all the groups, parks, public works, including snow removal equipment. Um, this contract is uh, a, like a pay-as-you-go type of contract where we only pay for, for what we need um, as we go. And so ultimately, there's really just two reasons for, for this, uh, this increased contract amount request. The first is just cost escalations. Parts are more expensive um, over the last year. And then finally, um, and I know probably folks are, are sick of hearing about this, but uh, last year's big winter, um, we had a lot of repairs. So just the volume of parts that we need increased substantially compared to last year's, the last few years. So, um, so those are the main reasons for the increase. And then we're, at, uh, we're also asking for the additional one-year renew renewals uh, in accordance with county pr uh, procurement policy. Um, and really behind this, uh, we want the increase first because the contract is working very well um, with the fleet division supplying contracts and managing the inventory, but also the, the vendors agreed to honor the same terms that they've had with the original agreement as well. So we want to continue really a good thing. So uh, with that, happy to answer any questions. Okay, and bring back to the board. Board, do you have questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Supervisor Holm. So this was uh, formerly Reeves Auto Parts. That's right. Genuine um, bought them out. That's right. So there has there been any change? I mean, probably continued the same employees that are working for uh, for the county. We well, yeah. So the the contract right. You have it correct. So no. the genuine parts company was I think uh, purchased purchased the Reeves contract. The contract was assigned to them. Yeah. Um, I believe it's the same folks. I'd have to confirm, but I think for the most part, yeah, it is the same people, same contract and same people. So, uh, you know, I think having been in the business is very important to have parts on hand. Right. When you have something going on, you want to get it back on the road, because I know it seems like you have a large shop, but you don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, anyhow, so I appreciate it. So, anyhow, I'm, I'm good with this. Okay, thanks, Supervisor Holmes. Okay, any other questions by board members? Okay, seeing none, any questions or comments from the audience online? Okay, hearing none, um, we have a motion. Approval, approval. Okay, motion by Supervisor Holmes. I'll second. And a second by Supervisor Landon. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so right now we are going to move on to item 10. We're going to skip over C and move to item 10, County Executive Approval of Funding and Authorization for Agreements for Three Projects in the TOT Sponsorship Program and Authorization for Placer County to Enter into Two Agreements with North Tahoe Community Alliance for TBID Funding. Good morning, well, Stephanie. Well, good morning. Good morning, uh, Chair. Jones, members of the board, Daniel Karen, good to see all of you this morning. Stephanie Holloway, your deputy CEO uh, in the Tahoe area. So um, an item before you this morning, as you mentioned, uh, approval and authorization of agreements for projects uh, in the TOT sponsorship. So um, just to go through this briefly, as you recall, uh, we were before your board back in October of 2023. Uh, your board heard a presentation related to a number of Eastern County projects and programs um, proposed by the North Tahoe Community Alliance through their sponsorship program for the use of TOT over the course of a three-year 
sponsorship program. So at that meeting, uh, staff was directed to prepare use of funds agreements for a number of those projects to move forward uh, back to your board. Uh, the total amount uh, that we briefed you on, $18,369,454 uh, worth of transient occupancy tax uh, projects, 13 projects in total. Um, so those agreements have been working through the process. Uh, if you recall, we were here um, before you back in December. Uh, six of those agreements were brought before your board uh, for approval on the 12th of December. So today, a number of projects continuing to kind of work through the process. Uh, three, um, three additional projects and programs to authorize funding of TOT, and then two additional um, agreements uh, with the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association for not TOT, but TBID, the Tourism Business Improvement District Program Funds. So those are contracts with the NLTRA uh, receiving authorization on that. So uh, an overview of all 13 projects uh, is in your packet. I won't go through those today, but just to highlight um, a number of the, uh, the projects that we are asking for authorization today, uh, funding for the Tahoe City Downtown Access Improvement Project. So this is a project in Tahoe City uh, on the Grove Street um, parking lot, expansion of that parking lot really provides us with an opportunity to improve not only parking, but overall circulation in the Tahoe City area. That's a project that our uh, Public Works Department is working on, so use of funds agreement uh, with them um, for that. Also, expansion of our TART Connect. Uh, our TART Connect program was, as you recall, initially started as a pilot uh, in our peak season times. Um, overall support, overwhelming support for that project continuing to move forward, uh, and we are looking to advance that project in more of a consistent year-round um, deployment. So funding for TART Connect um, to continue that program year-round. Uh, also a pilot program uh, in the transportation space uh, with the uh, Truckee North Tahoe Transportation Management Association, so the TMA. Uh, they have a proposal on the table uh, for a pilot program to uh, expand van pool. Uh, so kind of a commuter service from uh, Washoe County, uh, their cities, Reno, Carson City, um, to bring employees that are working in Eastern Placer uh, up to our region through a van program uh, service. And then also, uh, last but not least, in the housing space, uh, continued funding for the Lease to Locals program. This is a long-term uh, rental incentive program that we have in the in the region, facilitated by uh, Landing uh, Landing Inc. They're now called. Uh, so, uh, with that, uh, like I said, three additional projects um, related to the 13 that we presented, um, as well as some agreements for uh, funding of TBID moving forward uh, to support these projects. So. With that, I am happy to read in the actions. They are lengthy. I will read them. OK. Um, so <laughs> we are you. asking your board this morning to approve. And sorry, I just got some new glasses over the weekend. So I'm realizing they aren't the best Still here this adjusting. morning. Um, we'll ask you to approve $602,754 in TOT funding uh, for one project. This is T4 on our list, uh, North Tahoe Workforce a van pool program and authorize the county executive officer or designee to execute use of funds agreement with uh, county council and risk management approval. Number two, approve $2,184,000 in TOT funding and interdepartment memos for two Placer County led projects. This is T1, uh, the Ta Tahoe City downtown access improvements and T5, the Resort Triangle Transportation Planned Project Component uh, TART Connect expand, Expanded Service Hours upon County Council and Risk Management Approval. Uh, number three, authorize the County Executive Officer or designee to enter into a grant agreement with the North Tahoe Community Alliance uh, and receipt of Tourism Business Improvement District funds for a total of up to 340000 uh, for the TBID 6 project, North, uh, sorry, the Tahoe City Downtown Access Improvements in substantial, uh, substantially the same form as attachment D of your packet, 
and upon county council and risk management approval. Number four, authorize the county executive officer or designee to enter into a grant agreement with the North Tahoe Community Alliance and receipt of tourism business improvement district funds for a total of 500,000 for the TBID2 project lease to locals program in substantially the same form as attachment D and upon county council and risk management approval. And last but not least, number five, determine that the requested actions are all not projects under the California Environmental, Environmental Quality Act guidelines 15378. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. Okay, I'm gonna bring it back to the board. Anyone, uh, comments, questions? No, okay, seeing none. Any comments or questions from the public online? Sure. Okay, bring it back to the board again. I'll move approval. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Gustafson, a second by Holmes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Okay, so we are going to, um, we're being adjourning now. Okay, I'm going to let County Council take it away. The board will now uh, adjourn to closed session to consider five items of existing litigation, one item of anticipated litigation, and one item of public employment. When the board returns to open session, it will then consider uh, item 9C. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you again. I think, what time do we re-adjourn? I mean, we come back together at 1.30? We'll come back. Okay, first we'll come back and we'll report out in closed session, and then we will be adjourned until we come back for our 130 item. First we'll deal with 9C. First we'll deal with 9C, and then we'll do our 130 item. Okay.
Okay, I'd like to bring the meeting back to order and County Council will, will report out on closed session. The board met in closed session to consider the following. Under existing litigation, Friends of the West Shore, the board heard a report, no action requested or taken. On Brookfield's restaurant, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. On Miskovitz versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. On Wilson versus County, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. On Vintu, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. Under anticipated litigation, the board heard one potential case and heard a report about the same and provided direction on a 5-0 vote. Under public employment, the board conducted interview discussions, no action taken per vote. That concludes the report out of closed session. Okay, <clears throat> so we will be moving to item 9C, correct? And um, Madam Chair. Supervisor Gustafson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my husband does work for uh, the disposal company that we're contracting with. He does survey work for them, and so I need to recuse on this item. Thank you for that. Okay, we're going to have to take a short 10-minute break, um, and we will resume in 10 minutes.
<laughs> Everyone stare at Jared. Poor guy. <laughs> Bonnie Gore. <laughs> Jim oh, yeah, Holmes. Okay, to our big wide audience, <laughs> we're going to reconvene this meeting and we are going to move to item 9C, the 12th Amendment to Solid Waste Handling Services Agreement, Placer County Eastern Regional Landfill Incorporated and Tahoe Truckee Disposal Company Incorporated. Receive an update on long-term agreement negotiations and one-year extension of agreement, authorize requests for proposals. So take it away, Jared. Good morning, good afternoon, morning, something. <laughs> yeah, three after, so it's good afternoon. 
All right, once again, Jared Deck, Program Manager for Environmental Engineering. Um, good morning, Chair Jones, Supervisors. So I'm here to present the item before you, which is a solid handling uh, services agreement contract along with the 12th Amendment, and also an update of negotiated terms for a long-term deal. So to give you a little bit of background, um, for the solid waste handling contract, uh, we're talking about the area in franchise area two and three. So that's the area in green and pink, kind of here, pretty much Colfax East all the way to the state line. Eastern Regional Landfill is located just south of Truckee off Route 89, um, where we talked about earlier about the biomass facility. It's located at the same site. There's a closed landfill there and a material recovery facility for processing of all solid waste. So within the history, uh, TTD, um, Tahoe Truckee Sierra Disposal, has ran this agreement for quite a while. Um, they first had a sanitary agreement back in 1972. Um, they ran this as a family operation until 2003, at which point the county actually purchased the property, the closed landfill, and the material recovery facility from them, and the county now owns that. And since 2003, ERL Inc. and TTSD Inc. have been the operators of that facility and operators of the waste um, servicing as well. And so they've had that contract for quite a while. They've had it for seven years, and then in 2015, we did another seven-year extension. Then at that point, we've been working through SB 1383, the Organics Recycling Mandate, and had two one-year extensions past that point while we were still working with some long-term negotiations with them. So that leads us to the current contract, which will expire on June 30th of 2024 this year. So within the ask, um, this is an aging facility. It's been around for quite a while. So our first request is going to be some facility upgrades that we're doing. Um, this is maintenance of the existing facility, points that have been deteriorated past usability, and which are currently impacting operation of the facility. So the big two things that we're looking to do is replace the backup generator. This is used for on-site power during outages or anything of the sort during the wintertime mostly, if we have large snow events, they lose power consistently up there. So they need that power to operate the mature recovery facility and process all the trash they have on site. Also within the diagram here shown on the board, uh, replacement of the floor is the next big ask that we have for that. Um, the concrete in this facility has been worn down. It's constant tra traffic and large excavators moving over this, moving the trash around, and so the concrete has been impacted and is degraded to a point where it's actually starting to impact operations. And so our goal is to replace the yellow boxes here, so stage three, stage two, stage four, and stage five, kind of going across the board. We completed the project in the green box already on the exterior section, and looking to do this in stages as well. We can't shut down the facility fully at any point, so we have to do this in a particular order in order to continue operation while we're doing these repairs. And so the ask for these, the backup generator cost $586,324. Um, the floor cost $1.875,210. So next item is a long-term extension. So we've discussed this a little bit in the past. We've been working with them substantially on this for, for quite a while. Back in August of 23, we brought to your board an item to start working on the long-term contract as well as a potential RFP. And at that point, we were still negotiating with ERL TTST. We wanted to have two paths forward in order to have a contingency in place in case that long-term deal fell through. And so during that process, after we got the approval from the board, we started working on that agreement and at the same point negotiating these terms. And we felt after that process, ERL TTST came back with some very good negotiated terms that they had proposed to us. On the screen, kind of highlighted some of the, a few of the items that we feel are very important to this agreement. And then also there's additional items through that too that are not included in this, but are still in negotiation. So out of these items that are outlined up here, um, the big thing is full compliance with SB 1383. That's the state mandated organ, organic recycling. And so we have to divert 75% of our organic waste from going to landfill. So that's all of our tree waste coming in there, any food waste coming into the facility, all that has to be um, diverted from going to landfill. And so we're mandated by the state to have that. So this contract now has that requirement completely on ERL TTSD within this new negotiated terms. Also, in order to make that compliance, there's a lot of regulatory um, 
tracking and spreadsheets that have to happen. So we're asking them to add one additional person at full, uh, sorry, one additional half-time full-time equivalent. So one person who's gonna work their half-time specifically for this operation of 1383, also business outreach for food um, waste diversion. This also includes upgrades of the facility. We have about $2.8 million worth of facility upgrades that we're going to require them to do for this. Outside of the floor and the generator, there's a lot of other stuff that needs to be improved on at the site, and so that's gonna be included into this long-term contract. One of those things is a scale. So we'd have two scales at the site. Currently we only have one, so that restricts operation where there's, sometimes there's a long line of cars coming into the facility that have to be weighed in. And so this will expedite that as we're moving forward. The next one of the biggest ones is a shell concept. So currently the way the contract works is anything over $10,000 that needs to be repaired is the county's responsibility. So at the facility, if anything breaks above $10,000, the county's on the hook for that cost. In this new contract, the way we're looking at it is a shell concept, and so the county would only be responsible for the outer shell of the facility itself. And so the roofs, the external structural components, um, any of the drainage stuff going into the facility. Um, everything else inside the facility would be the contractor's responsibility. So if anything breaks with inside that, it's their responsibility to do it. Also, this gives us additional leverage to help um, incentivize them to provide better maintenance for the facility and keep it in better shape since they'll be the ones actually responsible for maintaining it or doing the, any of the additional improvements. Now onto the solid waste pickup. One of the big changes that we had from the community who reached out was the businesses, especially along the lakefront. Um, summertime, there's a big influx of tourists into this area. And so during the weekends, they normally had a Friday morning pickup and then a Monday morning pickup. And so they had a large amount of trash coming in for some of those restaurants and bars who had that big influx of visitors during that time period. And they didn't have enough space to hold all that trash over the weekend. And so we negotiated with them to get a Sunday morning service as part of that. So now they'll be able to do it Friday morning, Sunday morning, and then Monday morning. So they'll have kind of a break in the weekend in order to take some of that trash off their site. And some of that's restricted by space as well. Parking is a big deal up there and some of the Commercial buildings just don't have enough space to enlarge their trash service, so this additional pickup will help with some of those aspects of it. Um, also, we included in the contracts penalties for non-compliance. So if they are in, um, if they don't fall through with the 1383 compliance or any other measures, then there will be penalties that we can hold against them in order to force them to actually have that in place. So those are some of the kind of the higher level items that we thought were very important to kind of discuss and bring to your board. There's still additional items in there which are in the staff report as well. So next, um, kind of as a contingency measure, um, we're requesting the approval of an optional one-year extension as well. So if the negotiations don't move forward or if we have hiccups in service or if there's any other issues that come along while we're negotiating this or if we want to go out to RFP, we would like to approve a one-year extension so that we can implement that at pretty much July 1st of this year if needed. And so the terms of that will be our normal cost of living adjustment, so a 4% increase, which would they, they would have been entitled to anyways under our normal negotiating terms. And then some additional pieces of equipment on the stranded asset list, which we already have going from our last one year contract extension. And so the next optional request as well is for a uh, request for proposals, an RFP process. This is an option for the board too, is if they don't find that the long-term extension is um, approved by the board, then we can also go to an RFP and solicit bids from the public and see what options we have going forward from there. We also wrote into the agreement, if we do move forward with the long-term agreement, the board approves that. Within 60 days, if the ERL TTSD does not sign that agreement and get it back to the county once they receive it, then we'd automatically move forward with the RFP process. So building in some contingencies, that one-year extension, and also this RFP process as well, make sure we have options moving forward so that if the long-term agreement is not in place, we can still move forward with other options of getting a hauler in place to manage and operate that facility. And so this last page, we got a long one here. Um, but I'll read through the items. So really what we're looking for is just kind of direction from the board to understand if they have, um, you guys have an interest in extending a long-term deal with ERL TTSD or the options of doing a one-year extension and also going out to RFP. 
So the first item is approved 12th Amendment to the Solid Waste Handling Service Agreement with Placer County Eastern Regional Sanitary Landfill, Inc. and Tahoe Truckee Disposal Company, Inc. Authorized reimbursement for replacement of the failed backup generator at an estimated cost not to exceed $586,324. And repair of damaged sections of the Eastern Regional Material Recovery Facility floor at an estimated cost not to exceed $1,875,210 and authorize the director of public work or designee to execute the amendment subject to county council and risk management concurrence. The next item is to approve a fiscal year 23-24 budget amendment, AM00933 for CC12005 Eastern Regional Landfill Fund in the amount of $1,561,534 with an increase in revenue in the amount of $1,000,000 $55,251.77 from CC12086 Environmental Utilities Capital Fund and cancel the balance of $500,006.282.23 from CC12005 Eastern Regional Landfill Fund Reserve. Um, next is to receive an update on the status of negotiations for a long-term agreement with Tahoe Truckee Disposal Company, Inc. and Placer County Eastern Regional Sanitation Landfill, Inc. Next is to authorize the Director of Public Works or does need to execute the one-year extension of the Solid Waste Handling Service Agreement if a long-term agreement is not approved by the Board by June 30th, 2024, subject to the Council and Risk Management Concurrence. And finally, authorize staff to release a request for a proposal for solid waste handling and processing services contract in franchise area two and three, subject to county council and risk management concurrence. And last, determine the proposed actions are each not projects pertinent to CEQA guideline section 15378. And just a reminder, the last two items, the approval of the one-year extension and the RFP are optional items where we can have those in place with your approval and be ready to go if needed. Thank you very much. I'll bring it to the board. Questions, Supervisor Gore? Thank you, Jared. Appreciate that. So just a couple of questions. First of all, I appreciate you working with the current contractor. And uh, the first question is in regards to SB 1383, um, how likely are they able to meet the requirements of that of the 75% diversion of organics? If I understand correctly, they don't have the same type of um, requirement to do like the the food diversion from individual households because they are in the area in which they are, correct? Yep. So what, what's the likelihood of them being the 1383? Yeah, and so just to kind of clarify, so 1383 had different regulations for facility-based versus pickup. And so we had exemptions on the service side to not collect food waste, but we're still actually required to divert it from the facility itself at one point. And so this has been the long-term kind of process we've been working with Cal Recycle is to get out of that facility requirement as well. And so we recently got that, and so now we're exempt from collecting and diverting that food waste in this area, just due to bears is the main reason why it's exempt from that area. Um, and so with that process, we've made some tweaks along the way and some adjustments in their actual recovery um, abilities and processes at Eastern Regional Landfill. And currently we're working through the final numbers, but our last numbers were showing that they actually potentially will be above 75% already. Great. And so we're hopeful that that will continue, um, but we haven't finalized those numbers, so those are preliminary right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, so you've, you've had conversations with the contractor, correct? And so they're pretty much in agreement with these parameters of the proposed yes. contract. Yes. Okay. Yes, so we've because been working directly with them to define what these parameters are in negotiated terms. They're fully on board with this. It's just a matter of bringing it to you guys for that approval. Okay, because you know, there's one condition that, you know, if they fail to sign the long-term agreement, then we would go to an RFP. How likely is it that they will not sign a long-term agreement? I'm pretty sure if we provide this to them, they'd be very happy to sign this long-term agreement. Okay, that's, um, I think that that was my only other question. Appreciate that very much. And they did agree to that 60-day period as well. We talked through that about how long it would take them to get through the actual agreement once it's provided them. Their legal counsels would have to review it, understand it, and make sure it falls within what they agree to. And at that point, they'd return to the county. Thank you. Supervisor Landon. Um, just a quick question. So number on number five of the actions, if it's um, an optional, if we don't come to a long-term agreement, um, does that have to be stated in the in the action or since it just says authorized staff to release an RFP, I just wanted to make sure that it was 
clear that it was an option. I mean, does that make sense? Maybe Carrie. Okay. I just wanted, I didn't know if it needed to be stated in there that it was an option as opposed to. Oh, I'm waiting for staff to respond. Okay. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong person. Yeah, so we reviewed this with council and felt like that was the best language. The approval process is to make sure it's ready to go. And so if we need it, it's there to go. Um, it's not exactly just putting out to the, um, to the street for bidding directly right now. Okay, seeing <clears throat> we have no one in the audience, so is there anyone online? <laughs> okay, all right, we'll bring it back to the board for a motion. I'm happy, oh, go ahead. Happy to move approval of all the items on the screen as listed, and you might have read them, I'm not he sure, did. but they're he all did. on the screen. Yeah, he did. Okay. I'll second. Okay, and first uh, motion by Gore and a second by Supervisor Landon. Roll call. Holmes. Aye. Gustafson absent. Gore? Aye. Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Actually, could we, for the record, make sure it's Gustafson recused? Oh, yes, Gustafson is recused. Uh -huh. so I Thank you. Think that, that concludes our board meeting today, right? No, oh, oh. oh, that's right. We need to adjourn until our 1.30 item.
Okay, we'll call the meeting back to order at this time. And we will be moving on to our 1.30 item, item six, Community Development Resource Agency. Take it away, Chris. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Jones, board members, Chris Bahuli, your planning director. Uh, I'm here today to request a continuance for uh, the Smud Country Acres item. Uh, there was a, a mistake with the ordinance that was attached to the item and therefore we're requesting a continuance to the February 27th uh, board hearing. Okay, do we need to take action on that? Give us some guidance. And if the clerk could we yeah. confirm the time? So if we could get an action to continue this item to February 27th at 1 p.m. And now you have a motion to that effect. Oh. Um, if Mr. Garabini wants to speak, he can only speak on the continuance. Okay, excuse me. Mr. Garabini, apparently the only thing you could address right now would be the continuance of the item, but not actually on the item. Okay. Substantively. Okay. Thank you. Michael Garabinian, Placer County Tomorrow and Pacific to American Divide. Well, this is the, only the latest uh, uh, effort, uh, uh, opportunity to not know what's going on with this project. I'm trying to just limit it to this one, but there's been a long line way back to the PCCP up to now where the public isn't involved and doesn't know what's going on. And here's kind of another example. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, I'll bring this back to the board. Now we need a motion. Okay, motion by Supervisor Holmes. Um, I'm happy to second the motion. Okay, and a second by Supervisor Gore. And we will have, oh, no roll, no roll call. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion is approved and we will be continuing. Thank you. Okay, everybody, uh, that looks like we've covered everything we have to cover for today. So this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>